Perfect. Okay. Um, thanks a million, everyone, for coming along tonight uh, for your interest in this. Um, it, it's really well timed. The Garden Bird Survey started this week. Um, temperatures have really only dropped in the last two weeks or so. Um, and that is going to be pushing more and more birds into your garden in the coming weeks. Um, so I think this is time to, um, to perfection. Hopefully um, you learn learn a lot. And um, as Andrew said, if you have any questions, um, put them in the chat or something like that, and um, I'll get to them at the end. Just to give you an idea of the layout of the talk. Sorry. Um, I'm going to start off with the frequently asked questions. So every year, every winter in Birdwatch Ireland, we get the same questions asked uh, time and time again. Um, so I'm going to try and cover as many of them as I can think of. And um, if anyone has any other questions, again, um, put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, after that, I'm going to talk about taking part in the Irish Garden Bird Survey, uh, just how you go about it. And then after that, I'm going to go into the trends that we've seen over the lifetime of the Garden Bird Survey, so showing you just even just a kind of a fraction of the, the really interesting um, ups and downs and, and changes between winters and all that kind of stuff for a whole host of, of garden birds. Um, so as Andrew said, this will probably take about an hour and a half. Uh, I do apologise if I'm talking very quickly, but um, it'll be up on YouTube again. So if there's anything you want to, to double check, uh, you'll have that opportunity. Um, I'll start off by saying thanks thanks to Bali Malou, who have been sponsoring the Irish Garden Bird Survey for the last couple of years. As Andrew said, we are a charity, British Ireland is a charity. Um, we have very limited funds, uh, and so the, the support uh, for the last couple of years from Ballymaloo has been really, really appreciated. It's really helped us um, push the Garden Bird Survey on, go from strength to strength, and that's very much reflected in the kind of analyses that we get to do then. Um, Birdwatch Ireland members, again, we are a charity. We literally wouldn't exist if it wasn't for people taking out um, annual membership every year. Um, so thank you. If you're a Birdwatch Ireland member already, thank you very much for your support. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, if you're not a Birdwatch Ireland member or you're stuck for a Christmas gift for someone, uh, please do consider that um, as a possibility. Garden Bird Survey participants, whether you're a member of Birdwatch Ireland or not, uh, you can take part in the Garden Bird Survey. Um, and people who've donated as well uh, with their Garden Bird Survey submissions in the last couple of years. Some people do, some people don't. Uh, if that is something you're able to do, it's hugely, hugely appreciated as well. And obviously all the photographers there have used a lot of my own photos for this talk, but um, all those photographers who really, really appreciate them sharing, letting, letting us uh, use their images. Andrew, can you see those ye yellow scribbles on my screen? I can, yeah. Oh, God. I don't know how we're going to... We're going to get around that. <laughs> I'll go again. It's only on that slide. No, it was someone was drawing and it meant um, it showed up. So you can see that slide okay? Yeah. Okay, this will be the last hiccup. Um, okay, frequently asked questions. First question we always get uh, what is the best food to put out for birds? Uh, and there's no simple one answer to that. Every different type of food you get has advantages and disadvantages. There's going to be some birds that enjoy it, some birds that don't. Uh, for various reasons. The market for bird foods has gotten kind of ridiculous in the last couple of years. There's a lot of stuff that's very gimmicky uh, and quite expensive too. Uh, I would tend to keep it pretty simple in my own garden, to be perfectly honest with you. Top of my list in terms of recommendations is sunflower seeds. I think with sunflower seeds, you're going to get the broadest range of species uh, that you'll get with any of the bird foods. You get all of the tit species, you'll get sparrows, finches, um, you know, reed bunting, yellow hammer, tree sparrow, if you're lucky enough uh, to be in that kind of um, part of the country. Robins will eat it, all of the big birds would go for it as well. Absolutely everything uh, will eat sunflower seeds. Um, there's a lot of different types of sunflower seeds you can buy. The best ones are the sunflower hearts, which are on the bottom left uh, of, of that photo there. Um, so they're the ones without the shell, essentially, and it saves the birds time and energy and effort getting the shell off. Um, it also means, even though they're a little bit more expensive than the other ones, it means everything that you're buying is food, as opposed to buying a bucket of, uh, of sunflower seeds and, you know, uh, a ready to get back into the shell. Um, if you can't get the sunflower hearts without the shells, the black sunflower seeds are the next best thing. They've quite a thin shell. It's quite easy for birds like goldfinches uh, to get the shell off and get into the, the inner bit. Um, if you buy sunflower seeds in some of the supermarket chains or the pound shops. It'll be cheaper than you've seen it um, elsewhere. And that is generally because they use um, striped sunflower seeds. And that's a much thicker shell. It's gray with kind of white stripes down the side. It's a much thicker shell. 
birds will eat it, but it definitely takes them more time and effort to actually get into it. Um, so that's a kind of a, a trade off there in terms of the cost and, and what you're getting for your sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds are high in calories um, in winter. Don't worry about any, any nutrients or anything like that for your birds. It's all about calories. It's all about energy and fat and surviving the long, cold winter nights and even the, the short, cold winter days as well. So during the winter months between now and February or March, it's all about calories. Um, so yeah, sunflower seeds are top of my list um, every time. Second to that, I tend to have peanuts. So I feed my birds uh, in the garden here at Wicklow all year round. And the two things I tend to put out are peanuts and sunflower seeds. And um, peanuts, you'll all remember, go back 20, 30 years, that was, you know, maybe the only um, proper marketed bird food that people were putting out. There's a reason that it's so popular and that it's kind of stood the test of time. A load of different species will go for it. Again, all of your sparrows, your buntings, your, your finches, your tits, they'll all go for it. Um, again, it's ticking that box of being very high in calories uh, to get the birds through the winter. Um, there's no mess with it, so the whole thing gets eaten. Nothing's going to fall uh, underneath your feeder and attract kind of unwanted species, uh, whether they're birds or mammals. Um, so yeah, and it's really, it's quite cheap as well compared to a lot of the other stuff on the market. So you get more bang for your buck, uh, certainly with peanuts. Um, I'm finding at the moment my sunflower seed feeders are emptying a lot quicker than my peanut feeders, but I still put out a mix of the two because it just means maybe some of the more dominant species might. Um, Go for the sunflower seed feeders, but it just gives the other smaller birds maybe a chance to have a, a nibble on some of the peanuts and stuff like that as well. So there's no harm putting out a mix, and it doesn't matter if maybe one is running out quicker than the other, um, it's still well worth putting out peanuts. Um, golden rule, never give anything with salt to birds because they're very small bodies and even a small amount of salt can make them very sick. So never be tempted to give salted peanuts in any form um, to your garden birds. Um, speaking of gimmicky bird foods, um, you can get bird peanut butter now, which I think is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's kind of something between peanuts and fat balls. It doesn't do anything that normal peanuts won't do. It doesn't give the birds anything that normal peanuts won't give them. Um, there is always the fear, and you see it quite a lot on some of the Facebook group groups. Um, people say, okay, well, I don't have the, the special bird peanut butter, but can I just give them something from my kitchen? And the answer is, no, you definitely can't. Um, any peanut butter that is meant for human consumption more than likely has salt added to it, so it'll make your birds very sick. If you go for the slightly more expensive, uh, more natural type of peanut butter with no additives and all that kind of stuff, and you get it in the big plastic tubs in, in the supermarkets, when you open that up, that's got a layer of oil and grease on top of it. And even if you pour that away, everything in there is quite oily, quite greasy. And if you put that out for your garden birds, that is going to get on their feathers. If that gets on their feathers, it's going to immediately destroy the um, waterproofing and uh, heat retention properties of their feathers. And if you do that, they're literally not going to survive the night. Even a small patch of feathers on the body of a, of a blue tit or a goldfinch um, damaged in that way um, can be lethal. So if you're going for that peanut butter, make sure that it's specifically marked for birds. I would say there's absolutely no need to go near it at all. Um, just stick with the peanuts, cheap, um, attracts a lot of species, really, really good to put out. Some of the other bird foods here. So fat balls, a lot of the different species enjoy fat balls, all of the finches. And um, if you hang it in such a way that the blackbirds and song thrushes um, can perch on the feeder without kind of rocking it too much and getting kind of destabilized, uh, they'll go for it as well. Robins, black caps, a load of species of fat balls. Again, all about calories and that's all about, that's what winter feeding is all about. You can get them quite cheaply. Um, if you look at the ones that are in the photo here, they're like shot puts. If you buy them from a pound shop or maybe a supermarket, a lot of them are really, really solid. And if they're solid when you pick them up, they're going to be quite solid for a bird to try to peck away at them and eat them. So again, if you're getting bird food that's really, really cheap, there might be a reason that it's really, really cheap. A lot of those cheaper brands of fat balls um, have ash added as a, as a filler ingredient that just helps bind the whole thing together. So it makes a nice appealing looking fat ball maybe, but uh, it's absolutely no value to the birds. So I would say, you know, you can, you get what you pay for. Uh, I'll come on to it in a second, but you can make your own fat balls at home. That's really, really cheap and really, really fun to do. So I would highly recommend that uh, if you're thinking about putting out fat balls. Mixed seeds, you see it down there, bottom right there. Um, it's grand, it's cheap. It usually has a lot of filler ingredients. That's why it's cheap. And um, you've got millet, you've got maize, you know, some of those big grains. And what you will find is 
a lot of the smaller birds can't digest them, so they will preferentially pick out stuff like sunflower seeds out of it, uh, and they'll just cast away the rest, and you're going to have a lot of mess underneath your feeders. If you're someone who has a lot of um, house sparrows or green finches, or you have a lot of pigeons and you don't mind having a lot of pigeons, uh, mixed seed is perfect because pigeons, uh, sparrows, and green finches are able to digest those bigger, coarser grains. Um, but otherwise, again, you get what you pay for. I would say if you're spending a lot of money, spend it on sunflower seeds and you'll see absolutely no waste with that. Niger seed there on the bottom left, it's a very fine black seed, very oil rich, again, really, really good for the winter. Finches in it. and when I say finches, I really mean goldfinches, siskin and redpole. And um, they're in a kind of a branch of the finch family and they, their bill is kind of, um, has evolved to get access to these fine little seeds. A lot of the other bigger birds will not bother at all with it. Even stuff like blue tits won't really bother with it because it's just so fiddly and finicky to try and get the, the kind of seed itself out of the shell. So they won't bother with it. It is quite expensive. And as well as that, you have to buy a special feeder for it. You'll find it's quite messy because as birds pull out some of the niger seed, a lot of it just spills out and spills onto the ground. And then underneath your feeder, you're going to have this pile of husks from niger seed that has been eaten and niger seed that has just spilled and hasn't been eaten. So I find it quite messy. And, um, you know, people used to swear by it uh, for attracting goldfinches. You have no trouble attracting goldfinches if you put out sunflower seeds. So I really don't think it's worth, worth it, to be honest with you. If you're getting a lot of goldfinches and you've good success with it, you know, stick with it. But I would just say my preference would be for sunflower hearts every day of the week. Um, mealworms, um, and there's actually a lot of problems getting mealworms into Ireland at the moment because of Brexit, and it's classed as a food stuff or something to that effect. Um, so what you'll see instead of mealworms now are soldier fly larvae, which kind of look similar and again do a whole completely similar thing um, from a bird's point of view in terms of what they provide. Um, I don't tend to provide them over the course of the winter. They're quite expensive and um, not all of the species are going to go for them. I tend to hold on to mealworms until the spring and the summer and my resident robins and dunnocks and blackbirds as well go for them. You know, they're a little bit closer to what they would naturally be eating at that time of year. Um, so there are foods like fat balls you want to provide in the winter, not in the, the spring and summer. And mealworms, I would recommend that you hold off and um, wait till the spring and the summer. The other thing is, you know, if, if snow and frost hits for a couple of days and, and you don't have much bird food bought in, have a look and see what's in your kitchen. Chopped up apples, pears, grapes, bananas, birds will all take to them. Certainly the, the thrush species, blackbird, robin, and uh, blackcap will all go for them. You might find that it takes them maybe a day or two to cop on what it is. Um, but once they do, they'll absolutely love it. And um, a lot of this, the supermarkets do deals on apples and pears and stuff like that over the winter. So I've already started buying some of them, chop them in half, throw them out on the lawn, um, and blackbirds get used to them pretty quickly. And after that, um, they absolutely love them. The other thing is soaked um, sultana raisins, currants, soak them in some water. You could throw them out. Um, again, a good mix of species will go for them. I think every house in the country has you know a packet of sultanas or raisins left over from some Christmas pudding from five years ago you know so it's a great way to use that kind of stuff up and um, some of the bird books say mild grated cheese for, for birds like wrens, donuts, robins I've heard mixed results for that to be perfectly honest with you and uh, I have a feeling it's probably one of those things that the birds have to get used to it and maybe if you're putting out other bird foods that the likes of robins and donuts are just going to go for the, the seeds or the peanuts rather than bothering with with the cheese um, uncooked porridge oats, again, cheap and cheerful, it works a treat. Um, cooked rice, brown or white is fine, just make sure it doesn't have salt added to it. So there's a whole range of things that if you get caught out, it's very, very cold, um, have a look. Just make sure that whatever you're putting out isn't moldy, that's, that's always the golden rule as well. Never anything with added salt and never anything with mold on it if you're giving it to birds. Make your own fat balls. This is really, really fun, whether you're an adult or a kid. There's something really satisfying um, despite how really, really simple it is, um, putting these things together, putting it out in your garden uh, and seeing the birds eat it, uh, great. Very, very cheap to do. A block of beef dripping, you'll see the Frytex block there, that costs less than a euro. There's some cheaper um, alternatives, uh, the supermarket home brand stuff. If you're an adult and you want to do it quickly, throw it in a saucepan, melt it down on a low heat, and then throw in handfuls of raisins and currants, and um, mixed seeds, sunflower seeds, um, you can maybe break up some peanuts and throw them in, porridge oats, all that kind of stuff. 
um, pour it into a container, a uh, lunchbox, um, something from your recycling bin, leave it in the fridge overnight, uh, and you've got a big block of uh, fat balls to put out um, for your garden birds. If you're doing it with kids, you can go down the messy route, which is you don't heat it um, over a, in, a, in a saucepan over the, the cooker. You can just get that fry text, get that beef dripping, and if the kids mash it up between their hands, the heat from their hands will start to melt it. And then you can just get really, really messy and just start mashing all those ingredients in, uh, and that does just as good a job as well. Um, so I highly recommend that. You'll find the beef dripping, that fry text block, in, in all the supermarkets, and it's near the butter and the margarine and stuff like that. Highly recommend that. Um, like I was saying with the apples, it might take a couple of days for the birds to cop on what, that's, what this is when you put it out. Don't lose hope. Um, I did a workshop in the Phoenix Park a couple of years ago showing 30 or 40 kids how to make these fat balls. And they all look great fun, big mess. Um, I made a load of them myself as well and brought them home. And I hung them out in the garden and I was watching them for three, four, maybe five days and absolutely nothing touching them. And I was thinking, oh God almighty, I'm after... In, you know, getting all these kids really enthused for making this food for their birds and nothing's going to touch it now and they're all going to be absolutely heartbroken. Um, it did take four or five days. Eventually a robin started pecking at it and then in no time at all, all the other birds caught on that it was food that was there for the taking and that's it. Um, they all got a taste for it. They all loved it. So give this a go. Um, don't lose hope if it takes a couple of days. I guarantee it. It's worth it. Love it. Distressing image here. This is a great tit that has died because it has gotten caught in this um, plastic netting that you often get when you buy fat balls and you often get it when you buy peanuts as well. Now, you don't see it as much in the shops as you used to, but there's still some manufacturers that sell their peanuts or fat balls in this fine plastic netting. And what happens is birds get their leg caught in it. They try to fly away. They can't fly away. And unfortunately, they die. So if you buy these fat balls or buy these peanuts in a plastic netting like that, First thing you should do, take the netting off, put it in the bin uh, and just put your, put the food in a proper feeder is, is the important thing. So when it comes to, to bird food, I do find diversity is key. You know, give your birds loads of different options. Give yourself different options because some stuff is more expensive than others. Um, different foods work better at different times of the year. Some birds you'll find much preferred to feed on the flat surfaces. So that's on the ground underneath the feeders on a bird table. You might scatter some seed on the top of a wall or on the top of a flat roof shed or something like that and give them these options. Put out multiple feeders. I always say it's much better to put out two feeders that are half full rather than one feeder that's completely full. Because if you have two feeders out, there's more options for birds to get to the food, get something to eat without having to push another bird off or have a scrap with another bird. That's all wasting time and wasting energy that they, they don't need to do. So loads of feeders half fill them you know fill them up to a third put them in different parts of the garden and you'll just be catering for all the different species then that you want never underestimate the value of putting out water and um, so in the winter months there's obviously a lot of water around but the problem is that it freezes over so birds need to drink water every day they need to wash themselves in water every day if that's frozen over uh, they're gonna have to fly around for quite a while to find something suitable so Make it easy for them to put out a little dish of water, nothing too deep. They don't want to be submerging themselves completely. What they want to do is be able to stand up. Their feet are getting wet, but none of the rest of them is. and um, None of their feathers are touching the water. And then they dip their head in under and have a proper wash um, like that. So I use, if you can imagine, the trays that you get for underneath them, um, plant pots, get them in any gardening centre. They work an absolute treat. Um, and make sure to... Replace the water regularly. If it freezes over, get rid of the ice, put in some fresh water, um, and you need to clean it out in the same way that you would clean out your bird feeders on a regular basis as well. Speaking of bird food, speaking of bird feeders, speaking of all that kind of stuff, um, if you're spending money on this kind of stuff over the course of the winter, do remember that Birdwatch Ireland has a shop. Um, you can give your money to a gardening centre, you know, that has a load of branches all around the country. Or you can give your money to Birdwatch Ireland so you're helping the birds not only by feeding them in your garden but you're helping them by supporting Ireland's largest wildlife conservation charity at the same time. If you're still a present for someone consider giving them a membership and you get a lovely welcome pack and they get magazines through the year uh, you definitely won't regret that one uh, and if you're trying to think of some other kind of gift we do sell uh, optics, binoculars, uh, soaps, we sell calendars, Christmas cards, books, mugs, all that kind of stuff. Um, so just have a browse of the website and um, some of you might have the, the shop catalogue um, and just see if, if um, we have something for you there. 
there's a lot of talk lately about uh, sustainability of things like buying bird food and, and feeding garden birds. By far the most sustainable thing you can do is to plant something that's going to be there for years and years to come. There's a, a list of different species there, um, kind of trees, hedges, bushes, that fruit at different times of the winter and that the birds will use at different stages of the winter. So even if every second or third year you were to plant, you know, one of these species in your garden and let it grow up and, you know, it's providing shelter to the birds, it might provide nesting sp space in the spring and summer, roosting space at night, um, it's natural food for the birds, uh, it's going to benefit other biodiversity as well. Um, so really do give that uh, serious consideration. You know, trees, bushes, climbers, flowers, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, don't be too neat in the garden and that includes um, over winter. Um, you'll just have a, it's a much more sustainable way. Um, kind of things. Another question, so moving on to the frequently asked question number two. Another question we get a lot is, why am I getting no birds to feeders? Now, sometimes this is just down to the time of year. If it's spring and summer, birds have spread out and they found a nesting territory and they're not as reliant on, on gardens as they were in the winter. Um, in autumn, you get birds moving around depending on where the food is, and there's a lot of natural food in the countryside in August, September, October, and um, seeds, fruits, berries, all that kind of stuff. So they don't need to come into gardens as much. And um, if at this time of year you're putting out feeders and not getting garden birds, um, make sure that you put the feeder near some shelter for the birds. So if you're alone like this and you say, I got some new feeders, um, I'm going to put it right in the middle of the lawn so I have a really, really good view of it. From a little bird's point of view, they're thinking, great, there's some food here, but I'm going to have to fly several meters to get to that food. And worst case scenario, a sparrowhawk's going to fly over, and I'm going to have to outrun that sparrowhawk um, for several meters before I can get to some shelter. So if you're getting very few birds, I would move it close to the edge of your garden where there's trees and bushes and things like that. The birds are going to feel much, much safer. It's a short distance to hop to get the food. Um, over time, if you want, once the birds are used to it, you can move it out a little bit. Um, closer to the middle, but just always keep that in mind. And again, it comes back to the benefits of planting something in your garden that'll be there for years to come. And um, that's just another piece of that. Third question, how do we stop crows? How do we stop crows coming to our feeders? How do we stop squirrels? How do we stop starlings? All that kind of stuff. Obviously, all these species need to eat too, but um, you know, I completely accept that it can be a bit annoying. Um, you really kind of, it becomes a bit of a DIY job. It becomes, especially with the crows, it becomes a real battle of the wits because what you might do is try something out and give it a week or two and those crows, there's a good chance they might figure it out and you have to try something else again. You can buy squirrel-proof feeders like this one in the photo. So it's got a cage around it and that'll keep a lot of the bigger birds away like the crow species as well. Um, you can see the person here has a, a lid off a, a tub of bird food um, put on the top and I guarantee if a rook or something like that lands on that, it's going to be quite unstable, it's going to rock them uh, and they're going to feel a bit panicked uh, and probably um, abandon their attempt. Sometimes we say to people, hang your bird feeders from elastic and again, if a big bird lands on that, it's going to bounce up and down and scare them. If it's a seed feeder, that's just going to spill seed all over the ground and the crows are going to be absolutely delighted. So. If you're having problems like that, you just have to consider a way to maybe stop the food falling from your feeder and hitting the ground, if it's something like mixed seed. Um, you really just have to kind of get creative. You have to see how the birds are accessing the food and you have to kind of a bit of a DIY job. Um, in that way. Some really good examples here. Um, the one in the middle there is a dog crate, you know, for moving your dog around the place. Um, you can hang the feeders up in it. All of the small birds have plenty of access. It's keeping all the big birds away. Uh, it also means that any seed that spills is, is just falling onto that hard surface. So the birds can easily hoover that up themselves, or it's easy for you to wipe them and clean as well. Really good idea. Um, one on the right there is two hanging baskets tied around a feeder, and you can see a little um, prey underneath. So any, any seed that spills isn't hitting the ground. It's just getting caught there. And again, the, the small birds have plenty of access. Keep them cheerful and that'll do the trick, no problem. Um, and you can see a real hardcore job there on the left. If you're really good at your metal work, uh, you know, give that a go and that'll definitely do the trick as well. One thing I always do with all of my feeders as standard is, you know, if they're hanging on a branch or hanging on a hook, maybe from a specific um, pole that you've bought for your feeders, get some twine or gardening wire or something like that and just tie to make sure that the the arm of the feeder is tied to it because otherwise squirrels and rooks and stuff like that will figure out that they can just knock the feeder over the hook uh, and land on the ground and just have a, a 
peace and love. Now, on that same topic, a lot of people you know, email us and say, um, I have no birds since the magpies arrived. I have no birds since the starlings took over the place. I have no birds since X, Y, Z came in. None of these species, if you get a load of sparrows, crows, starlings, anything like that arriving all of a sudden, you know, you, your other garden birds are not going to fly miles away and say, geez, we're never coming back there again. They know there's a reliable source of food there. That they know um, in the winter how valuable that is. They're going to keep coming. What, it, what does happen is, though, that the smaller birds change their behavior. So if you've got bigger, more dominant bird species like these um, that look like they're taking over, the smaller birds, you know, rather than flying to your feeder and eating a bit of seed, chewing away there in the feeder and then grabbing another bit of seed and chewing away on that and maybe grabbing a third bit and, and flying off of that. They're going to get in, they're going to grab some food and they're going to get out quickly. So it's, it's a change in behavior. It's not the end. They're going to be less visible to you as well because of that, because they're not hanging around on the feeder uh, as much, but they're still going to come and go. So you don't have to worry about the smaller birds. Um, though, you know, I do understand that it can be an inconvenience. Um, Sparrowhawks then, they come up quite a lot. We usually, it's kind of a love-hate thing with sparrowhawks. Um, a lot of people are thrilled to see them uh, as well. They should, it's a really good sign if you've got a sparrowhawk in your area that there's plenty of small birds around as well. And um, you have to remember that the sparrowhawks need to eat too. You know, I realize that it can be a bit distressing um, if they grab something um, on your lawn and put them away with there. Um, we do tend to get people saying, Jesus, my sparrowhawk, it's, it's, you know, it's taken all of the small birds and, you know, they kind of think it's the most efficient hunter in the world. Um, there's loads of studies done on sparrowhawks in different parts of Europe. And there's studies done in, in America and Asia of their sparrowhawk equivalent that would be a similar size, a similar type of bird that occupies a similar um, ecological niche. And all of these things find that their hit rate, their success rate um, for catching prey is around one in 10. So every time you see a sparrowhawk catching some food in your garden, there's definitely been four or five, if not eight, nine, ten times it was chasing a bird. It was using up a huge amount of energy, really struggling, didn't manage to catch a bird. So you can kind of get a biased impression by just watching what's going on in your garden, but you kind of don't know what that sparrowhawk has gone through for the rest of the day. Um, so just have a little bit of sympathy for the sparrowhawk. Um, again, like all those other birds, the sparrowhawk is going to make the birds abandon your garden. There's sparrowhawks literally all over the country. Um, and there's all those other species outnumber them by 100 to 1, easy. Um, they will make your birds more vigilant maybe for a while. To be honest, they don't even do that much. I, I've had sparrowhawk visiting regularly in my garden, and the small birds come back very quickly when the sparrowhawk is going through. If you really want to discourage them, you can move your feeders around maybe every couple of weeks, and it just means um, the sparrowhawk isn't able to predict exactly what part of the garden that the small birds are, are kind of congregated in. And again, move your feeders close to trees and shrubs, and it just means the small birds are pretty privileged. Is it okay to feed all year round? Uh, loads of studies done on this too. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. Um, people worry that if they feed all year round, that the maybe the birds aren't going to get the right nutrients that they need, or they worry that the birds are maybe going to become dependent on it. And they're worried that what if I move house, or what if I get hit by a bus, or something like that. Um, you know, there'll be no food and all the birds are going to die. Loads of studies done on this. They do not become reliant on it at all. As we get into the spring and summer, those birds are going to be using your feeders less and less. Even if they're visiting right through the summer, your really local blue tits and grey tits and stuff like that, um, the adults will eat the food. It'll still only be a third to two thirds of their diet because they know themselves that they need the natural stuff. They need caterpillars and invertebrates to get all the right uh, nutrients that they need. So they're never going to be getting 100% of their food from your feeders. They know well how to find the natural food. And um, what it does is it just gives them a quick fix. It makes life easy for them. It saves them time. It gives them a bit of energy. And they can spend that time and energy um, looking for more food for their chicks. So it definitely gives them a bit of a helping hand. That being said, I don't feel that you need to feed the whole year round. But if you do, don't worry. That's what you're going to do. Um, and avoid fat-based foods. Um, fat balls, suet pellets, that kind of stuff uh, in the summer. And in summer, then the opposite problem um, to the water freezing over is that there's no water because it's all dried up. Um, so right through the year, put out a, a dish of water in your garden. This is a really important one, um, disease and feeder hygiene. You should get into a really good habit of at least once a week, giving your feeders a really thorough clean. Um, when you put out feeders, you have a handful of feeders in your garden, you're gathering a huge amount of 
individual birds and a huge amount of species into very, very, very close proximity to each other. Um, when you do that, um, it's kind of it's the opposite of social distancing, essentially, and you're creating the possibility and you're increasing the risk that various infections might pass between the birds. Uh, and if you're putting all this effort into feeding your garden birds, the last thing you want to do is make them sick or see sick, sick birds in your garden. Um, so get into a really good habit of cleaning your feeders, cleaning your water dishes. The best example of this is um, trichomoniasis. So it's a parasite that lodges in the throat of birds. Um, it has been around for literally thousands of years in pigeons and in birds of prey. It affects some, you know, it doesn't affect others, you know, it definitely limits the population to some extent, but it wasn't a huge problem for those species. Um, because people in the UK were feeding their garden birds and they were bringing birds like wood pigeons and feral pigeons to carry this parasite um, into very close proximity with birds like green finches, which used to be incredibly numerous in, in gardens in Ireland and the UK. It was creating opportunities for essentially a, a, the perfect variant, again, to use kind of COVID terminology, um, of this parasite to emerge. So this parasite would have ended up in a load of different finches um, over the years, you know, most of the time it did nothing. And eventually this, this, um, this version of the parasite evolved and it has had a devastating effect on our finches um, since that time. It was first documented in the UK in 2005. It was first seen here in 2007. I actually think it was here in 2006, if maybe even 2005. Um, it has caused, we've lost hundreds of thousands of green finches um, from Ireland in the last 15 years. They've lost millions from the UK in the last 15 years since this parasite took hold. There's no practical treatment for it. Um, so this is a green finch that's very sick with trichomoniasis. So the parasite is lodged in its throat. Parasite has gotten bigger. And over time, that bird has been unable to swallow food. And because it can't feed, it can't produce energy, it can't keep itself warm. And that's why it's got its feathers fluffed up. You can see it can't swallow the food. It's got a little bit of food stuck to its bill there. If you were to walk out into your garden, all of your finches and other birds would fly away. But the really sick ones will be much slower to fly away, or they might keep hopping around in the grass um, unless you were to really chase them. So they're all the signs to look out for with trichomoniasis. Uh, no practical treatment. There is a medicine that you can give if you're a racing pigeon or your chicken or your prized merlin or peregrine if you're a falconer and um, gets this parasite. There is medicine you can give them, uh, but that's fine and well if you've got a captive bird that you can give the correct dose to every day, get rid of it. Um, if you start putting this medication in a water dish in your garden, you're going to have these sick birds drinking from it and you're also going to have the healthy birds drinking from it and if you've ever heard of antimicrobial resistance, which is an increasing problem for people, where things that affect us are you know, becoming resistant to treatments because they've encountered it and, and eventually these variants have evolved, same thing would happen with the trichomonas parasite. So you might feel great that your garden birds have gotten a bit healthier and they're not sick anymore, but you're just creating the conditions for this uh, even worse parasite to evolve. So unfortunately, there's no practical treatment. What you have to do is take in your feeders for about two weeks. That lets the Healthy birds ditch essentially the, the sick birds. The sick birds unfortunately are going to die, but you just kind of have to do the best thing for the flock. And so by stopping feeding, again, the birds aren't going to be so reliant that you know, that's going to be a problem. Um, stop feeding for two weeks, give the healthy birds a chance to escape. There's other infections birds can get, you know, where there's a lot of droppings gathering on the grass and stuff like that. That creates, you know, chance for bacterial infections. We do say to move your feeders around the garden every couple of weeks. Um, if you're not in a position to do that, get the hose out and maybe just hose down some of the droppings so they can wash into the lawn. You see a picture of here of great avian pox. That's a big enough problem in urban parts of, of Britain, especially around London. It doesn't seem to be a huge issue here, but I did get a couple of reports of it last year in, in Dublin. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. A good chance you'll see chaffinch with these kind of um, leg abnormalities. It's not lethal to them, but it's definitely a disadvantage. Sometimes they lose toes or they lose full feet. Um, you know, there's various other bits and pieces, you know, again, when you're bringing all these birds into close proximity. The main thing you can do is keep a, a very strict hygiene regime. So clean your feeders at least once a week. Um, if you're like me, you've got a load of feeders that you're not using that are in the shed. Um, every Sunday I'll go out, take in all my feeders, uh, that have been hanging out for the week, give them a good wash. And what I'll do is I'll put the other feeders out. So it's a good excuse 
um, if you see a nice feeder in the shop, buy twice as many as you need, and you can just rotate them on a weekly basis. Bring the feeders in, put them in a bucket, put them in your kitchen sink, um, a small splash of bleach, um, a load of warm water, maybe a, a little uh, squirt of washing up liquid, give them a good scrub, give them a good rinse, um, dry them out, um, and you're good to go again. It's very simple, it's very easy. Just get into the habit. The last thing you want to do is um, see sick birds in your garden. Um, no matter how hard you try, unfortunately, I'd say two of the last three years, I've had trichomoniasis outbreaks in my garden, even though I clean my feeders every week. So it is it is very difficult to avoid, unfortunately, at the moment. But I have some peace of mind knowing I was kind of doing everything I could. Unfortunately, I had to stop feeding for a couple of weeks um, once I saw that, but that's pretty well do. Um, so those are the most frequently asked questions we have. Um, I can answer any questions at the end, but also you will see those topics gone over and fleshed out a bit on our website. So do check out the Birdwatch Ireland website and the Irish Garden Bird Survey section for that. The Garden Bird Survey itself, so it started this week. Um, still plenty of time to get involved. Um, please do spread the word to a family member, a friend, a neighbor, um, someone you love, someone you hate. Uh, I don't really care. Just try and get as many people as possible uh, involved in the survey. It's really, really fun. It provides us with really, really um, important, useful data uh, on an annual basis. So the survey has been going for 33 years. Um, started in the late 1980s. Um, Jim Wilson from Cork, um, some of you might be familiar with from um, Mooney Goes Wild, things like that. He started the survey. Birdwatch Ireland back then was called the Irish Wild Bird Conservancy. Back then, the rule was to only count the birds that are eating the food that's bred specifically for them. Um, You'll know from watching some birds like robins and dunnocks that, you know, they'll be hopping around underneath the feeder. It's not immediately clear if they're eating food that's spilled from the feeder or not. So about 25 years ago, we, we expanded the definition and we just said, any birds that are using your garden. So that means birds on the feeders, birds hopping around on the lawn, birds in the hedges or in the trees. Um, if they're birds of prey and they're flying over your garden, you could say that they're hunting. So they're obviously looking into your garden for food. You can count them. And um, if you're lucky enough to live near a wetland and you've got brent geese or hooper swans or lapwing flying over your garden on a regular basis, they're flying over your garden but not using your garden. They've no intention of stopping in your garden. Um, so you can't count them for essentially only birds that are using your garden. Survey runs from this week to the end of February. It's kind of the core midwinter period. It's when the birds are under the most stress. It's when the weather is the coldest. Um, so it's the time when they're using your gardens the most. You don't have to do every single week. If you're going away for Christmas or you've missed the first week or two or anything like that, absolutely no problem at all. Try and do at least 10 of the 13 weeks um, and that will give us uh, really good data that we're able to use. And if people only do a handful of the weeks, you know, it, it's not as reliable, unfortunately. Um, in terms of how much time you spend, that's entirely up to you. We tend to get people emailing every year saying, you know, I'm in work, you know, nine to five. So it's dark when I leave for work and it's dark when I get home. Um, so I'd only really be able to do it on the weekends. That's absolutely fine, no problem at all. Um, I'm in, my same, in the same boat um, most years as well. It's not the type of survey you have to park yourself by the window for, for two hours straight, um, concentrating you know, really, really hard. Um, I just do it looking out my window when I'm making a cup of coffee and doing the dishes, um, just walking in and out of the kitchen and that kind of thing. Um, so a couple of glances like that, having a quick look at what's around, making notes, that's absolutely perfect. You know, and that might add up to a huge amount of time each week, but that will be sufficient to let us know what's going on in your garden. You record the highest number of each species that you see per week. So for every species, when you write down a number, you're saying, I looked out my window and at that day, at one point during the week, and I saw that many of that bird. So I looked out my window and saw 20 goldfinch at one time. You don't add birds of the same species, you know, at different times of the day, and you don't add them to um, so that's really, really important. So here's an example of that. If you saw five starlings this morning at nine o'clock, and then at three o'clock you saw two, the highest number you've seen at any one time was that five. So five is your number to write down in the survey form, and that's your number to beat for the rest of the week. So unless you see more than five in one glance, essentially, um, later in the week, that's your number for the week, and you start fresh then the following week. Equally, you do not add between days. If you saw one blue tit on Tuesday, two on Friday, two on Saturday, um, two is your number. That's the highest number you've seen at any one time. You've seen it on a couple of different days, but still the same number. That's the number you're writing down. And unfortunately, every year, a handful of people misinterpret this and we'll see people who, 
you know, they record something like 14 robins. And you know, well, 14 robins should be divided by seven and it should be two robins every day. That's not the way you do it at all. And robins are incredibly territorial, even in the winter months. So the most robins, you know, you'll see maybe should be about three or four. And if you see three or four, I guarantee you two robins are chasing the other two robins over there. So don't add between days, don't add at different times of the day. If you're writing down a number, you're saying, I looked out my window and at that moment in time, I could see that many of that species. To take part in the survey, so you can download this form from our website or you can just fill it in online. Um, one side of the sheet is where you tell us um, your name and address and the address really is just so that we know if you come back and do the survey in future years, that's the same garden. And we also are able to split out our data on a county by county basis because the birds using gardens in Donegal are going to be different to the ones using gardens in Waterford. There's be slightly different proportions. Some species would be more common than others. And so knowing the county is really, really important. And um, there's some other things there as well. Is your garden in an urban area or a rural area? Uh, roughly how big is your garden? What type of food do you put out? All really, really simple questions. You'll answer them in 30 seconds. And um, what provides us, it lets us look into the trends more. And I'll show you some examples of that later on. The back of the form then, you can see it there on the right hand side, you've got a list of bird species and the space to write in more at the bottom if you see ones that aren't listed. And you've got your weeks going across the top. So it's a column per week, start first and next week. Um, once you've done this, you can either post the form into us, you can email a copy into us, you can fill it in online as well. So if you fill it in online, you're saving us a lot of time and, and effort. So we'd really appreciate it if you're good with computers, if you don't mind filling it in online, we have an online system set up and it looks the exact same as the form, so it's very easy to do. You can fill it in week by week online if you want, or you can just wait till the end and fill it all in online at the same time. So if you go to the Birdwatch Ireland um, website and go to the Irish Garden Bird Survey page, you'll find it very easily. That's the tab you click to submit your counts online. You'll see more details there, taking part in the survey with that long tail tit photo, click there, and it will go into more depth about the do's and don'ts of taking part in the survey. Uh, very, very straightforward though. Um, you know, it really is simple. Um, so at the bottom there, feeding your garden birds, again, some of the information I've gone over, trichomoniasis and sick finches and what you can do. Uh, all of that information is on our website. So please do make that your first port of call. And um, there's a lot of Facebook groups where people ask a lot of questions. And unfortunately, some knowledgeable people answer and some very not knowledgeable people answer. And the person who's posed the question in the first place doesn't know who to believe. So I would highly recommend that if someone asks a question, you know, check the Birdwatch Ireland website, check the RSPB website, check the BTO website. I don't care what website it is, but if you're answering someone on social media about a bird question, please try and provide a link to an established website where they can be confident in your answer and it kind of and lets them know what they, they should believe and can believe. On a percentage basis, and um, this is the participation in the survey across the country. Now you'll see a bias there towards the likes of Dublin and Cork, big populations, Wicklow. Kildare, Meads, um, Galway, again, all have quite big populations. Um, if you're in a county that's somewhere down that list, um, your, your results are extra valuable to us because we don't want to be too biased towards Dublin or too biased toward Len Leinster. Um, now, we do actually get a very good spread across the country. This kind of makes it look quite bad. It's actually very good from a statistical analysis point of view. We do get a great spread across the country, but just know that if you're in any of these more uh, maybe rural counties, the further west or north you go, the more valuable your results are to us. So that's it. Um, the Garden Bird Survey, it's really, really easy. It's, you'll really, really enjoy it. Um, the more gardens that take part, the better. So if you could have one or two family members, neighbours, friends, you know, people are putting out garden birds, food and feeders anyway. And they're watching their garden birds anyway. Uh, just get them to go this extra little step uh, take part in the survey uh, they'll enjoy it it's a great conversation topic um, and it provides us with really really useful and important data so now i'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the trends that we see from the data over the last kind of 25 30 years the value of it and really i'm only going to scratch the surface here there's huge potential for a kind of scientific analysis that we hope to do in the coming years uh, we can only do that if you send in your data to us so Robin, more often than not, has been top of the rankings in the Irish Garden Bird Survey. On average, they're seen in 99.7, nearly 100% of gardens. Some winters, it has literally been 100% of gardens have seen a Robin over the winter. 
Um, the only times, the only species that's really beaten them uh, to first place has been the blackbird, um, blue tit as, as well as usually up there. Um, Latin name for robin is, this is something I'm not going to even try and pronounce, uh, but it's written there and it means solitary little red run. And as I said earlier, robins are really, really territorial um, even in the, the winter months. Um, you will find as well the robins spread out a bit in the winter. So you get the males staying maybe close to where they nested in the summer months, but the, the females will spread out a little bit wider, maybe somewhere that has food, but no food when nesting. Um, we get a lot of our modern Christmas traditions from the Victorian era. Um, but the, the kind of association of robins at Christmas and that time of year goes right back to the pagan era. Um, they used to be considered a symbol of the new year and a wren was considered a symbol of the old year, the year just gone. Um, back in the Victorian times, you would have had people, you know, their kids and their families have moved maybe to the next town over or moved to the big city to, to find work. They're not going to have the means or the money to travel home at Christmas. So what they're going to do is write a letter to their family. Um, and because of that, people are seeing their postman a lot of Christmas. This obviously turned into Christmas cards over time. Um, but the postman at the time used to wear these big red coats in the winter. So obviously it was quite cold. So they used to have the nickname the Robin. So that's one of the reasons that it's kind of carried on as a tr tradition um, to associate Robins uh, at Christmas. Um, one of our former colleagues in British Ireland used to, to love to point out to people that most of the robins you see on Christmas cards and Christmas decorations actually have a lot more red on them um, than they normally do. So really you can see on this robin here, the orange kind of red color comes about halfway down, uh, but you'll see on a lot of Christmas cards, you know, might go the full way down or three quarters of the way down. So I used to enjoy pointing that out. Not biologically accurate, a lot of Christmas cards, um, if you want to be really pernickety and might spoil someone's Christmas. Wrens then, you know, wren is one of those species that um, even if you're not into your birds, you know, a lot of people have at least heard of a wren and probably able to identify it as well. And um, seen in around 80% of gardens, which is really, really good considering they're not a species that comes to bird feeders. They're, you know, insectivorous and they really don't go for any of the foods you put out for them. Usually in the top 10, they do yo-yo up and down depending on how cold the previous winter or even the previous spring and summer might have been because they're so small that they have a a very high what we call surface to mass ratio. And that essentially means they're very, very small. Um, there's a lot of kind of skin area for the size of them and they struggle to retain heat. So that just means if the frost and the snow hits, um, they're really, really gonna suffer. Because of that, they form at night, they form these communal winter roosts. So that means they know it's really cold. They know they're really small and it's bad to be small when it's really, really cold. Um, so what they do is they share body heat overnight by huddling together. So they roost together in hedges. You can see here on the right, this is um, a photo from Kevin Collins from the Birdwatch Tipperary branch. And there's an old swallow's nest and it must have had about 20 wrens um, roosting in it overnight. So they've all piled in, they're all sharing their body heat and that's just gonna buy them a few degrees and buy them a few calories uh, and hopefully they'll survive till the next morning. Blackbird then, blackbirds occur in 98.9% of gardens. So if you round up to 99% of gardens, and yes, more often than not, that's not enough to get them first place. Um, absolutely beautiful birds. Um, they don't really use feeders, but they will eat fat balls. They do enjoy the chopped apples and pears. More often than not, you know, you'll see them shuffling through the leaf pile maybe in your garden. So a really good um, thing to do is to keep a leaf pile somewhere in, in one side of your garden. Um, you know, very, very common. They're here during the breeding season. A lot of people don't realize that we actually get a big influx of them. Hundreds of thousands of blackbirds coming here from Scandinavia and from Northern Europe as well in the winter. Um, so this is a map of blackbirds, essentially Irish blackbirds that have been found in other countries. So this information is gotten from what we call bird ringing. People who have the necessary training and licensing can catch wild birds like blackbirds fit them with a small little metal ring. It's kind of like wearing a watch to them. The ring has an individual code on it. So that individual can be identified again. And these are examples of where blackbirds were either ringed in Ireland and found by someone else in some other country or ringed in some other country and found by someone in Ireland. Um, not surprising there that Northern Ireland is lit up. Obviously birds don't see borders. There's no difference, you know, from blackbird moving across the, the Irish border there at all. It's just the same as moving from county to county. But you know, a significant number coming from Scotland, coming through the UK, Denmark, um, you know, as far away as Finland, a lot from, from Norway um, and, and, and Sweden as well. So 
Next time you're looking at a blackbird hopping around in your garden, uh, don't take it for granted. It could have come from a lot further away than you could imagine. So blackbird is our most common member of the thrush family. These are our other members of the thrush family. You've got the song thrush on the left, missile thrush in the middle, red wing, top right, and field fair, bottom right. Song thrush, nice warm brown colors, quite brown on the head, kind of uh, inverted heart shape um, spots on the chest. Um, very much acts like a blackbird to be hopping around, uh, rooting through the leaves, that kind of stuff. Missile thrush are a bit bigger. They've got this very pale head. You can see the kind of clumped spots on the left and right of the breast. They're big, boisterous, noisy birds. They sound like, a, you know, those old, old school football rattles. Really, really loud call. They can be a bit territorial in the winter. What they can do is they'll find a holly tree or mistletoe or something like that. There's loads of berries. And they'll say, right, that's my territory now until these berries are gone. So you'll see them chasing away smaller birds. Uh, facing away robins and blackbirds and um, have a whole life to for themselves. Red wing and field fair, they do come to gardens every year. And um, they're birds that, you know, given the opportunity, they will forage around in wet kind of grassland fields. I'm from Roscommon. There's loads of wet grassland fields in Roscommon in the winter. And as a result, there's a huge amount of um, red wings and field fair as well. This is the percentage occurrence of, of these thrush species in gardens. So you can see blackbird pretty consistent along the top there, 97, 98, 99% um, of gardens. Song thrush a bit below that, and they've got their ups and downs. Uh, middle thrush kind of in 30%-ish of gardens. Red wing 20%-ish, uh, and kind of 15% um, maybe for field fair. What will strike you there are the big increases. So those big increases were winter 2009, 10, and 10, 11. Um, Cast your mind back, they were very, very snowy for quite extended periods in that winter. So all of these, you know, grassland areas, all of these leaf patches in woodlands, all that kind of stuff were all covered in snow, no foraging for sun thrushes, mist thrushes, red and field fair. And as a result, they went to gardens. So that really shows, especially in these harsh conditions, the importance of gardens. That's when you want to get your chopped apples out, you know, stick them onto your, your you know, um, branch of your, your tree or chop them up, put them on the lawn, get the rake out and uncover maybe some grass area to let them forage because um, they're obviously not going to be able to get through the snow. Uh, and you'll see there again on the right hand side of that graph, winter 1718. So in the last, literally about the last three days of the garden bird survey that year is the beast from the east hit. So this is the data for that winter week by week for those four thrush species uh, left of blackbird. And you can see Week on week, all through December, all through January, most of February, pretty consistent for all of those species. And literally the last three days, you know, most of those species doubled um, in, in terms of the number of gardens that they went into. So again, really highlights the importance of it. Also highlights the reason why we don't just ask people to do the garden bird survey for one weekend or for one week. If we did that, we get a lot more people taking part, but the data wouldn't be nearly as good. And um, by doing it week on week on week, we can focus in then when something hits in the middle of the winter, at the end of the winter, we can focus in on that change and we can data underpin what we're saying about it. So that's the importance of doing these things um, week after week um, every winter. Blue tit then, absolutely gorgeous birds. I, I always say that, you know, if we didn't have blue tits in Ireland and you went to some foreign country and saw these lovely blues and yellows and contrasting with the blacks and the whites, absolutely gorgeous birds. Really, really lucky that they're so common in Ireland. 98% of gardens, once they were ranked uh, joint first, but generally they're in third, so usually in the top three, but generally in third place um, year after year, and that includes last winter as well. Um, this is the, the tit family. These are the tit species. So blue tit, really, really common there. Great tit, a bit less common. Cold tit, a bit less common again. But you can see they're all in 80% plus of gardens. Um, so these are real standard um, garden birds. And a bit more variation there with the cold tits, and you can keep, see a kind of cycle there for every maybe three or four years where they're kind of doing this up and down thing. And that correlates with the, the weather to some extent, but they're also kind of more built for woodland and um, forestry and things like that as well. So it's those years where maybe there's a lot of, of seeds and cones and stuff like that available to them that they're in gardens a little bit less. And there's also, because they're so small, they're not as small as um, the likes of even the long tail tit, but because they're small, um, they're going to get hit hard by cold winter. Well, so you might see a bit of a drop off after some of those cold periods. Now, 
those three birds at the top kind of follow a very similar pattern. Long tail teal is quite different. Again, they're absolutely tiny, so they're really influenced by those cold winters. Long tail tits aren't actually a member of the tit family. They're, they're more closely related to, to birds like flycatchers and stuff like that. Um, they're insectivorous, so they will, you will occasionally see them on a peanut feeder or a fat ball feeder. Um, but quite often they'll appear, and I've often had in my garden where they appear and I think, oh great, they're going to be hanging out for the winter and now I'll try and get some photos of them or, or hopefully more will join them. And they appear and they feed away and they look happy and they disappear and you never see them again for weeks and weeks and weeks. So they kind of do visit feeders a little bit, but not very reliably. Um, absolutely tiny, insectivorous, and they have that in common with um, some other species. So, no. I'll go back to that in a second. So long tail tits, absolutely tiny, insectivorous. They have that in common with gold crests and tree creepers. And they all have a, a very high pitched call as well. So actually these three species will hang around in these kind of roving groups, kind of a loose flock um, over the course of the winter. So if you see a load of the long tail tits on your feeders all of a sudden, don't get just too distracted by them, as cute and fluffy and lovely as they are. Have a quick look in your, you know, in the hedge in the kind of um overgrowth areas and you might be lucky enough to see a gold crest. Have a look, a quick scan on the, the bark of any trees that you can see from your window and there's a good chance you'll see a tree creeper. And that trick works quite a lot of the time. So do keep your eye peeled. If there's long tail tits around, there's a good chance there's gold crests and tree creepers as well. You can see here from the data, quite similar um, patterns of ups and downs between these three species because they hang out together. They're all tiny, they're all affected and by the cold weather to the same extent. And again, they're all reliant on insects as well, which become even less available in the cold weather. Because they're absolutely tiny, like the wren, they do this communal roosting at night. So this is absolutely adorable, obviously. Um, and if you go to YouTube after this talk, long tail tip roost, you will see some absolutely adorable videos. Um, unlike the wrens, when the wrens pile in together at night, it's every wren for themselves. Long tail tits hang around in flocks that are Kind of multi-generational families. So if you have 15 long-tailed tits in your garden, you're going to have parents and grandparents and this year's kids and aunties and uncles and cousins and everything all in that flock. So from an evolutionary point of view and a genetic point of view, they all have an interest not only in surviving themselves and passing on their genes, but in all the other birds passing on those genes too, because they're you know a lot of the same genes that they've got. So the birds in the middle of this photo, the two birds are in the middle are going to be the warmest because they're right in the middle that's where the heat is build up their heat nice and toasty because they're lovely birds and because they're all the same family those two birds when they're nice and warm will move to the end of the line they'll move to the left and right of the photo there and they'll give their other family members a turn in the middle where it's warmest so really really horrible well worth looking up on youtube Chaffinch then, chaffinch are very much our standard finch in ireland usually in the top five in the garden bird survey every year um, people tend to get good flocks of these, usually get five or six at least. Um, some people get much, much more than that. And again, this is a bird that we get migrants from, not as many as we get our, in our blackbirds, but you're still probably talking about tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of chaffinches joining our resident population um, for the winter. Their Latin name means bachelor finch. And the reason it means bachelor finch is because the guy who named them, gave them their Latin name, their scientific name, that was from Sweden. And it's the chaffinches in those really cold, snowy areas that have to migrate south and get out of those areas um, for the winter. But like I was saying with the robin earlier, the, the male chaffinches want to stay close to the territory because they want to be able to get back to quickly to it in spring. They want to claim that territory uh, and they want to have that sport. Females not as bothered. They let the men do that bit of the work. And the females, as a result, more females leave Scandinavia than males. So. Um, you get a higher proportion of males hanging around in Scandinavia for the winter and a higher proportion of females leaving. Um, same as before, these are chaffinches that were either ringed in Ireland or ringed elsewhere and subsequently found in Ireland. Not as lit up as the um, blackbird map, but you can see quite a lot of records there. Uh, Norway, Sweden, you know, coming down through Denmark, um, Holland, Germany, uh, UK as well, and, and Scotland, and stuff like that as well. So again, if you've got a nice flock of six plus chaffinches in your garden and um, good chance that some of them have come from much further away than you might have thought and especially if it's a female there's that added uh, percentage chance that they might have come from quite a distance. 
Chaffinch are our most numerous finch, goldfinch are our most popular one, and absolutely beautiful birds. And if you rewind, you know, 20, 25 years ago, they were in around a third of Irish gardens every winter, in the top 25, but nothing special. On average, you know, fewer than one per garden when you average things out. Fast forward now to the recent years, they're in 80 to 86 percent of Irish gardens for the last couple of years, firmly in the top 10. On average, each garden gets at least six, and I know some people get 60, but uh, on average, huge numbers. Um, so they've gone from strength to strength. Um, really important to have something like the Garden Bird Survey before these trends really take hold. So if we notice that, okay, goldfinches seem to have increased, and we, you know, we did a survey this year, you don't know what your starting point was. You don't know how low they were the previous year or five years before or 10 years before. But by doing the survey year after year, some species like robin and blackbirds stay more or less the same. Some species surprise you by going up, some species surprise you by going down. Goldfinch don't tend to take the same level of movement as even chaffinches do, but they disperse a lot. So they do a little bit of getting out of the colder areas uh, into warmer areas, milder areas for the winter months. To some extent as well, they just like to spread out around the place, explore the wider countryside, uh, find out where there's good feeding areas. Um, so goldfinches will kind of shuffle themselves all around Ireland, but they'll also move over and back with the UK as well, and we get some UK birds here. Um, so again, if you're looking at a goldfinch flock, it might have come from further away than you thought. Here's some examples from me in particular. So that red dot in County Roscommon is my parents' garden. I caught a goldfinch in my parents' garden. I put a little ring on its leg, uh, and that was around New Year's Day two winters ago. A couple of months later, that was found in Western Isles of Scotland, that exact same bird with that ring on it. Um, so what more than likely happened there was that was a bird that was born in the Western Isles of Scotland. Um, that's going to be pretty inhospitable over the winter months, so it decided to, to leave. Not going to go too far, but it came as far as Raskam and I thought this will do. This is nice and mild. Um, and I was going to spend the winter there, go back to Western Isles to return to my mate um, following the summer. That other red dot then is my garden in Wicklow, where I'm talking to you from now. Um, three goldfinches that are in my garden in the summer um, were subsequently found in three different parts of the UK. Now, some goldfinches I caught literally on that same day, um, and a load of the other goldfinches I caught that summer in my garden, still in Wicklow, still in my garden um, that winter. So it's really interesting that some of the birds in that same flock, you know, hanging around in the garden on the same day, some of them undertook this big movement of a couple of hundred kilometres, and others did not, and they just stayed very local. Again, when you're looking at a flock of goldfinches, you never know where they've come from. So goldfinch is a real success story. Numbers have gone up and up and up. Greenfinches, unfortunately, as a result of that trichomoniasis, have gone down and down and down. So it was 2007 when that first case was kind of documented um, in Ireland, but I wouldn't be surprised if maybe if it was a, a year or two before that, when, when it first started appearing here. I should say it doesn't just affect greenfinches. It also affects goldfinches. But the rate of increase in goldfinches is kind of able to take that hit, if you will. But there's a good chance you could see a sick goldfinch in your garden either. And um, same with chaffinches, same with siskins and redpolls as well. So it's not just greenfinches um, that suffer from that parasite, but they've undoubtedly suffered much worse. Um, so they're now amber listed as a bird of medium conservation concern in Ireland, a red listed now in the UK, and I think they might be red listed at European level um, because of that. One part of the garden bird survey on that first side of the sheet that I showed you, you can write down, if you see a sick bird in your garden, you can let us know what species, what week, and how many sick birds you saw. There's also a box there to take if you didn't see any sick birds. From a scientific analysis point of view, um, if you don't write anything in that section at all, I don't know if you saw a sick bird, but just didn't write it down, um, or if you didn't see any sick birds. So if you tick that box saying, I did not see any sick birds, we know that that's a, a confirmation um, of that, and that helps with our analysis. So that's just some extra information we're trying to gather, trying to see where is trichomoniasis across the country? Is it in the same places every year? Does it kind of move around the place? Um, you know, what period in the winter does it pop up? More in, in urban gardens or rural gardens, all that kind of stuff. Siskins and redpolls, they're in the same part of the, the finch family as goldfinches, as I mentioned earlier. And um, again, the value here of doing the garden bird survey over numerous weeks. If you do it in early December, um, very few redpolls and siskins are using gardens because they rely on, on the cones and the seeds and stuff like that available in woodlands, especially birch and alder and those kind of woodlands. Um, as those cones and stuff like that get depleted, 
um, there's less food for them in the countryside and they start to come into gardens. So you'll see them more and more as the weeks go on, they come into more and more gardens. Uh, and then by the end of February, um, you get quite a few siskins. And right even into March, uh, you can get big flocks of, of siskin and red pole as well in your garden. Um, again, another personal example of my own ranking. This can do something similar to goldfinch in that they kind of shuffle around a bit and sometimes it's logical and they're getting out of the cold areas. Sometimes there's no real logic to it except that they're flying around exploring the countryside and kind of um, seeing where the, the good feeding takes them. Um, so a cisco I ringed in my garden here in Wicklow uh, was caught by another ringer um, all the way over in Germany. So there's very few records, lots of records of ciscans moving across the, across the Irish Sea um, between Ireland and Britain. Uh, very few of them uh, moving to kind of mainland Europe, uh, but it does happen as well. So really, really incredible for a bird that weighs, you know, less than 15 grams um, to be doing this kind of movement. Um, Pigeons and doves then. So this graph is nearly as exciting as some of the ups and downs I've showed you already. But actually for these three pigeon species, you can see that they're actually creeping up and up and up. So, you know, from a conservation point of view, the really dramatic ups and downs are interesting. But this kind of gradual increase in different species in different locations is quite interesting as well. So wood pigeons, feral pigeons, and collared doves all increasing in Irish gardens over the last 30 years. Sparrowhawks, talking about sparrowhawks earlier, um, again, you get some people getting a bit hysterical saying, Jesus, there's never been so many sparrowhawks, their numbers are out of control, they're going up and up and up. Uh, if you look at this graph, over the course of four or five years, sparrowhawk numbers go up and then they go down in the next four or five years and then they go up and then they go down. You know, on average, they're in 25 to 35% of Irish gardens and that has been consistent for the last 30 odd years. You can see that big drop off there after the really cold winter. So that was obviously, their prey base was taken away from them. A lot of the small birds died because of the cold. There weren't as many around. And the sparrowhawk population disappeared there as well. We can see sparrowhawk numbers very, very stable um, over, over 30 years. Just focusing in then on the other birds of prey that you might see in your garden. Um, Irish Garden Bird Survey is not the ideal way to monitor, monitor birds like kestrels because they eat insects and they eat uh, small mammals and small birds in the winter. Um, you might be lucky enough to get one hovering over your garden. Um, in the early days of the survey, around 10% of people were lucky enough to get one hovering over their garden. Um, we can see that number has gone down and down. And this isn't the perfect survey to monitor this type of a bird, but it does agree with what we see in other surveys like um, Countryside Bird Survey and we'll say raptor monitoring work done by our colleague John Lusby and Pedro Termond and um, the Irish Raptor Study Group as well. Um, so they're on the decline. Buzzards, you'll all be familiar with at this stage, they're really on the up. Uh, it's really only in the last five, six, seven years that they've appeared in Roscommon uh, on a regular basis for me whenever I'm home. Um, but really, really common across the country now and going up and up and up, seeing whether it's circling um, over gardens or landing in people's gardens or on, on the telegraph wires or, or something like that. More and more gardens seeing buzzards. Red kites gradually increasing. Um, if you're in Wicklow, Dublin, maybe Mead, maybe a bit of Carlo, maybe a bit of Wexford, you might be lucky enough to see a red kite. A lot of those are the kind of the trends um, for species kind of merged together across the country. And um, if we start to tease it out, um, you can see some really interesting trends. So if, if we focus in and separate out the rural gardens versus the urban suburban gardens, um, pied wagtail is a bird you will see in every car park in the country, whether it's for Tesco, Little Aldi, whether it's a big um, shopping center, um, whether it's a schoolyard, pied wagtail you'll see there, you know, willy wagtail, people are well used to them. Um, and on that basis, I would have thought they'd be way more common in urban areas because we're so used to people um, so common in those kind of areas. Actually, they occur in twice as many rural gardens as they do in urban gardens. And you can see there's similar ups and downs there in terms of the trend. Quite interesting, they're literally twice as common in rural areas. Um, and again, by filling out that first sheet um, of the survey, um, you know, it allows us to delve into these kind of details. A lot of species are the exact same in rural and urban areas but some of them aren't, and where they're not, um, it's quite interesting. Black cap is a species of warbler. We have them in the, the summer. They migrate south to Spain and Portugal and Morocco and, and places like that, um, and they all clear out. Um, over the last 50 years or so, black caps from Germany and Poland and parts of Europe around that area used to follow a similar migratory path route you know, kind of down into to southern Europe. Um, some of them started copying on that 
actually there's a lot of food available in gardens in Britain and in Ireland, and it's actually not that bad. It's, it's pretty mild um, most of the time. And they, over the last kind of recent decades, they've evolved this new migratory um, route so that we now actually have a good proportion of black cats in gardens across the country. In the summer, you'll definitely get way more of them in rural areas. I would have thought maybe that might be the same in the winter. Not at all. Again, twice as common um, for black caps in urban areas as it is in rural areas. So that kind of fits in with that theory that uh, it's feeders and the food being put out for them or for other birds that attracted black caps and, and helped them evolve this migratory pathway. In urban areas and suburban areas, you're going to have a higher density of, of bird feeders. You're going to have more things like fat balls and more fruits and stuff like that put out for them. Uh, and they obviously much prefer the urban areas. Uh, this is my favorite graph of the Irish Garden Bird Survey. So it shows a very similar trend for linnet, which is a species of finch. Very, very similar overlapping trend, urban and rural areas for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden something happened around 2006, 2007. And the linnets in rural areas kind of continued along the same trajectory, a kind of a gradual increase, slightly creeping up. The ones in urban areas went up and up and up. Um, really, really obvious change in direction there for the urban areas rural areas didn't see. So what happened about 15 years ago that might benefit a finch species in terms of coming to the gardens? That's what happened. Trichomoniasis, green finches, uh, that's my theory on it, is that green finches are, you know, are known to be one of the most dominant um, garden birds, green finches and house sparrows. Um, as a ringer, whenever I catch them and weigh them, you can tell they, they weigh about 30 grams. That's three blue tits, you know, that's two goldfinches. They're big, chunky birds. They used to dominate feeders um, and push other birds away, you know, and, and really take over. Um, not so much in recent years. And, and the rate of decline there looks similar for rural and urban areas. But I, I've measured it, and it's actually a more rapid decline in urban areas. So I think fewer green finches in urban areas is giving more opportunity for birds like linnets to start using feeders. And as a result, more linnets in urban areas. Wood pigeon then, so this is a, looking at things a different way. This is looking at the different provinces. And again, some species occur in very similar percentages no matter where you look. Some species quite different. Wood pigeon is not a species I thought would be most common in Leinster. I'd be thinking countryside, I'd be thinking it's not Munster and Ulster. Actually way more common in Leinster than they are in many of the other provinces. Chaffinch, I would have thought equally common all across the board. And you can see, Pretty much as common um, in Ulster, Connacht, and Munster, but actually much fewer in Leinster. Now, there's still in over 90% of gardens in Leinster. But you can see there, there's definite distance between them and a definite um, different, different pattern there. Sparrowhawks, then, again, I would have thought um, the more rural you go, the more sparrowhawks you're going to have. You're going to have more good quality hedgerows, more proper trees, more space for nesting, and more sparrowhawks then in the winter. No, Leinster actually gets more. I suppose it doesn't make sense when you consider visibility. So plenty of sparrowhawks all across the country, but in urban areas and in, in Dublin and all the, the kind of big towns in Leinster, you're going to be seeing sparrowhawks more because they're going where the birds are and there's isn't a huge amount of them. 10 minutes. Um, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so more sparrowhawks in Leinster. Um, so they're obviously following the birds. They're more visible in, in, in urban gardens uh, and in Leinster as well. Um, so I'm coming towards the end of the talk now. Top 10 birds in Irish gardens last winter. Robin, blackbird, blue tit take the top three places, and that was the same as the previous year. Chaffinch dropped down two places, and that let uh, great tit and magpie move up a bit. Coal tit jumped up three places. I had a huge amount of coal tits in my garden last year. Uh, what I The feeling I have is that they had a really successful um, summer, really successful breeding season and um, before that. Uh, loads of cultits around the place. Starlings up a couple of places. Goldfinch down a few places, which was a bit of a surprise, but there were a lot of people getting in touch with us um, saying that they were missing their goldfinches last year. Um, Wren down two places. Uh, I have a feeling, even though it was quite a, a mild winter, there were a couple of days of snow, a couple of days of, of cold frost, so I think that might hit them a little bit. Song thrushes did okay, but again, that might be that that same cold weather pushed them into gardens a little bit more, and hence they're jumping up in the rankings. Um, a lot of those bigger bodied birds, the, the crow species and the pigeons, quite well. They tend to do quite well because they don't suffer from the cold as much as the smaller birds. 
Fiskin jumped up seven places. Uh, people reporting them in huge numbers uh, right from the get-go. So they were in gardens way earlier than they usually are. There must have been a lot less natural food available to them um, from the get-go last winter. Um, bullfinches down. I definitely noticed that in my garden here in Wicklow, and they would still didn't visit a huge amount this this um, summer and autumn either. So I, I'd say they might drop down another couple of places maybe this winter. Um, Goldcrest dropped down five places. Again, like the rain, I think they were probably hard hit by the, the couple of days of snow and cold weather that we did have. We don't tend to worry too much about ups and downs, one or two places. You know, there's always going to be change between years, um, but bigger jumps up and down are, are definitely out for this. Um, ones to watch out for. So if you're doing the garden bird survey, you're going to see all your birds and you're going to get a much better idea, especially when you're writing down what's going on and what's happening in your garden over the course of the winter. When you're paying that extra close attention, the ones to watch out for, every couple of years we get what's called a waxwing winter. This absolutely beautiful bird um, breeds in Scandinavia, migrates south into kind of um, just in, into northern Europe and to other parts of northern Europe for the winter. But if there isn't the berry crop there for them, and the berry crop tends to fail every four or five, six years, um, they have to go further afield for food in the winter. So what happens is they come to we usually get a lot of reports of them in Scotland kind of um, coming up to Christmas, and then we know that they're going to come over here. So keep your eyes peeled for them. They can pop up absolutely anywhere. Um, another one to watch out for them is the brambling. So this is a species of finch closely related to chaffinch. Again, occurs in Scandinavia, and um, they're like kind of an orange black version of chaffinch. Um, when you're looking through your chaffinch flocks, keep an eye out for these guys. Already this winter, there's been a huge number of reports from all across the country. You never know when they're going to pop up. Sometimes they just um, hang around for a day. Sometimes they hang around for the whole winter. Um, a real nice treat uh, if you find these guys amongst your half-inch flocks. Woodpeckers, great spot of woodpecker, colonized Ireland about 15 years ago. Last winter, they were seen in 105 gardens in, I think it was 20 counties. Um, definitely an east coast bias. And the closer you are to Wicklow, um, the more likely you are to see a woodpecker. But again, they were in 20 counties last winter. This summer, I think they nested in every single county. Um, so without peanut feeders, they're always photographed on peanut feeders, and you might be looking at the support of woodpeckers. Um, before I finish up, if you have any questions, well, I'll answer your questions, but honestly, any thoughts you have after this um, talk, check out the Bird of Sound website, check out the Garden Bird Survey section. There's a good chance your question is answered there. If not, Feel free to drop us an email, get in touch with us on Facebook, um, and we'll try and get it straight. Um, some of the little things I touched on here, the weight of your garden birds, a lot of that will surprise you. How long do garden birds live? I didn't get to touch on that today. Um, where do garden, you know, some of your garden birds, how far do they travel to get to your garden in the winter? Um, these are all on our website as well. If you go to the news section of our website and filter for garden birds, and you'll find um, articles about these. Um, loads of photos, loads of maps, loads of loads of tables, and um, that could be really, really interesting as well. Again, you don't have to be a member of Birdwatch Ireland to do the Irish Garden Bird Survey, but it does help. Uh, you know, we're really doing our best for birds, and the more members we have, um, you know, the more resources we're able to, to cobble together, um, and when we're lobbying politicians to make decisions that are good for nature, good for wildlife, um, it, you know, being able to say that we have the support of X amount of members uh, really makes them, you know, pay attention. So please do consider it for yourself. Please consider it um, for a family member or friend as a Christmas present. Um, if, if there's kids in the family, bird detectives, um, if you get the family membership, you get two issues of that per year. Really, really lovely uh, magazine pitched kind of at, at kids, but, you know, it's very easy to interpret. Loads of good articles, uh, loads of little activities and word search and stuff like that. Um, if you're thinking of getting it for someone for a present, you're not just going to be handing them a magazine, um, which can be pretty underwhelming. Uh, you're going to be handing them a welcome pack. So it doesn't look exactly like this. It's kind of changed uh, in the couple of years that this photo has been uh, taken. But you get the magazine, which is fantastic. You get posters for garden birds, posters for seabirds, uh, and a load of other little bits and pieces as well. So please do um, keep that in mind. End of the talk, last slide. This is a robin who was photographed in the UK a couple of years ago, and it's got a genetic condition that means it can't produce coloured or dark pigments in all of its feathers. Now, quite often, this ends up being patches of white um, on various parts of the body of the bird. Uh, but in this instance, it looks like a Santa Claus. So I think it's a lovely one to finish on um, as we come up to Christmas um, and all that. So thanks very much for listening. And hope I answered any questions you, you might have. And I'm going to stop.
stop sharing now. Um, and Andrew, if you want to maybe coach us through some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brian, thanks a million for that. Comprehensive and encyclopedic. And it's, it's one of the subjects where the more you, you dive into it, just it's almost infinite, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I liked the elastic on the bird feeders because we're having a bit of a problem with rooks on the reserve at the moment. Uh, we've put a cage around it, but yeah, you're definitely going to give the the elastic, maybe some bungee yeah. cords on the big feeder. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, definitely well worth a go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think you've covered uh, a lot of the, the questions, yes. but we'll crack through some of them, shall we? Um, first of all, a question. <clears throat> so this is one, how strict, how strict are you about records, maybe? Uh, the last two years, I've seen long tail tits the day before the survey, but not during the survey. And this year, again, they saw them the day before. Um, if it happens, if they see them the day before the survey, can they mark it down? No. No, sorry. No, the survey is the survey. Well, we had that a couple of years ago. Dick Coombs, who works for us, and is our in-house woodpecker expert. Uh, and literally the day after the survey finished, he had a woodpecker on his feet. It's been absolutely sick. And, you know, afraid not. Uh, no, sorry. But you never know. Keep your eyes peeled and hopefully they'll come back. You know? Okay. Um, and then this is more for... I mean, some people are obviously working, so they don't get to choose the times. But is there a particular time of day that is best to note the birds? And is there a time when they're more active if you sort of have it, if you have the day to do it? Um, I would say about an hour after first sunlight. So you, what you do is in the winter, especially when the days are short, is to get these peaks and troughs of activity. So if you imagine it from a bird's point of view, if you haven't fed all night and the uh, winter nights are quite long. When you wake up, you're going to be going for the feeders immediately. So you get a peak of activity early on in the morning. And that kind of the first birds that appear will be blackbirds and robins and stuff like that. It might take an hour um, for the goldfinches and stuff like that to materialize. They're all going to feed up for a while and then they're going to have fed. They're going to go off and rest and digest and then they're going to come back. So you get kind of three, maybe four peaks of activity during the day. But I'd say if you're trying to focus in on one, about an hour after. Um, about an hour after sunrise. Okay, <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay, so any tips on a kids age 10 and 12 interested in garden birds over the winter? And I'm thinking maybe making those feeders yourself, the fat ball feeders. Fat balls are absolutely excellent. But even just doing the survey, like if you yourself don't know all of the birds that visit uh, your feeders, it's a really good excuse to look them all up, you know? You'll know a certain amount of them. And then if you see something unusual, take down some notes, try and get a photo of it, uh, look it up in a bird book. I, you know, I work for a bird watch earlier now, and it's a real privilege. Um, I first got interested in birds when I was seven or eight, and it literally just started when uh, my mother bought me a bird book, a small little bird book, I still have it, but I just used to go through it meticulously, absolutely loved it. So if there isn't a bird book in the house, get a bird book in the house as well. Yeah, good. Um, okay, so someone was actually asking about the, <clears throat> the nuts and bolts of, of recording the birds. So she was just saying she doesn't know how to count the birds. Um, if you count them every time you see a robin or... No, so it's again, so, it's that one glance out the window. So the survey, you know, if you see a robin now and a robin later, the robin laser could be the same robin, but it might not be the same robin, but you have no way to know that. So all you can say is that at any one time I've seen one robin. The survey takes account of that. Like it is a, not a flaw, but it is a limitation of the survey. But there's no way to tell if it's different or if it's not. So it, it's whatever you see in one single glance out your window. Um, it could be quite tricky for stuff like sparrows. And if you have a lot of goldfinches, you like if you've got 20, sparrows and you know you give me a count of 18 19 or 21 22 that's fine do your best if you're counting a big flock don't get too worried about pinning it down exactly just do your very best with the big flocks and the numbers will average out okay you know okay um lots of questions about attracting rats and mice but is there a bird food if, if you want to attract mice and rats yeah it's very easy to do <laughs> a bit too easy um, that, the problem there is always um, food spilling on the ground so you've got to stop it spilling on the ground. That might mean changing the food you put out. It might mean some DIY job to catch the food before it hits the ground. But that's always the issue. Um, food, there's mice and rats everywhere. No one wants them in their garden. Stop the food hitting the ground and it should solve that. 
And the question is about, is there any food that rats and mice don't like? I think I know the answer to this. Do you know what? There's actually that trick that I think it's, is this um, cayenne powder or it's one of the chili powders that you can get. And if you add it to your seeds or your peanuts, mammals have taste buds for it. So it'll be really hot and spicy to them and they won't like it. And that's squirrels and that's rats and mice. Um, but the birds don't have a taste receptor for it. So they won't mind it at all. Now I'd have to Google it to remember exactly what type of um, spicy pepper seasoning thing it is. Now it might get a bit expensive as well, but apparently that's a trick that works. But otherwise, yeah, the least, the least nothing, unfortunately. Uh, it, our bird, the, some of the imported bird food, is that having an effect on bird populations in the countries it's grown in? Is that an issue? Yeah, all, almost undoubtedly, yeah. Um, there's no, there's no way around that. Uh, like, the, I'm not going to dodge that question. Yeah, it, it more than likely does. Anything being grown on scale like that, it would be great to see more growers uh, closer to home. Again, stuff like Niger seeds, you don't need, you know, sunflower seeds. I think there are some companies trying to grow sunflower seeds in, in Britain uh, and in Ireland and, and closer to home, and that's going to give you all the the same things that Niger seed does. But Niger seed is coming from a huge distance away, so. Again, try and plant something in your garden that'll be there for years to come uh, and do keep an eye out, but it is very tricky to find stuff uh, grown closer to home. Uh, but if you keep it simple like that, um, that'll, you know, if you stop buying the Niger seed, that'll be one less thing. Yeah, it's definitely an issue. Yeah, um, you met, you, you've already answered this one about the goldfish. So gold, goldfinches are, the population is going up. There's someone in West Wicklow who is not seeing any goldfinches in their garden in, rec in recent years. <clears throat> but yeah. that puts the overall trend, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Yeah, so about 15% of people don't. And I can't think of a reason why, because they're just as common in uh, rural areas as urban areas. But um, if you're feeding um, something like mixed seed or sunflower seeds, it should be a matter of, of time, you know? And if you're attracting other species like sparrows and finches as well, quite often the goldfinches flying over will see all the other birds. They'll see the commotion and say, must be good here. But... Yeah, no, there's no kind of magic wand, but very strange, all right, yeah, the, the ones that don't. Um, kitchen scraps that are a definite no-no for birds. None of them with salt, none of them particularly greasy. Um, people always ask about the grease from cooking chicken and turkey and stuff like that for Christmas dinner. You can't put that out because it doesn't solidify in the same way that lard or beef dripping does. So that doesn't solidify. And again, you've got that issue of the oil and the grease getting on the bird's feathers. Um, so that's a big no-no. But otherwise, anything with salt, you could put out bread. Um, I would tend to put it in the food blender, maybe to, to chop it up nice and small for the smaller birds. Nothing with mold on it, nothing with salt on it, nothing greasy or oily, um, golden rules. Do you want to say anything about cats, Brian? Cats, oh Jesus, loads of things I'd love to say about <laughs> cats, yeah. Like, that's one of those times where you have to move your feeder away from uh, away from trees and hedgerows and stuff because the cats could be hiding underneath. Um, really, like, try and keep your cat in as much as you can. Um, keep an eye out. We always get people saying, no, my cat never takes anything. And unfortunately, that doesn't bear true in any of the studies done in any part of the world uh, with domestic cats. Uh, I know with my, you know, I know from, from home that my dad used to feed a cat and kind of feed it in the hope that by feeding it, uh, it won't be hungry and it won't go near the birds, but it's really a hunting instinct uh, and it's a, it's an entertainment thing is why they hunt um, in a domestic setting. So even feeding them isn't going to stop them um, chasing and, and killing birds, unfortunately. So do with that information what you will, but that is the unfortunate truth about it. You know? And then there's some questions about feeding garden birds. Just the, it's been beneficial to some species like goldfinch, etc. Um, is there any negative effects? Like the, the big, the big one is is the greenfinch one, where that would that trichomonas parasite wouldn't have jumped to greenfinches if people weren't feeding their garden birds. There's some really interesting studies done in the UK lately about the negative impact of uh, inflating the populations of species like great tit and blue tit by putting out feeders for them, and the negative impact that has on specialist species like willow tit and marsh tit. And um, those birds are really under pressure and essentially the blue tits and great tits are a bit more dominant. They'll kick them out of nests, they'll bully them around uh, and they think that's having a negative impact. In Ireland, we don't have a huge amount of specialist woodland birds that I think would be impacted to the same extent. So I don't think that holds true 
for feeding garden birds in Ireland and negative impacts on, on different populations. But that's why we're building the Irish Garden Bird Survey data. And there's so many questions I want to sit down and, and delve into, and hopefully we'll partner up maybe with, with university in the years to come and really tease those things out. You know, we certainly wouldn't shy away from those questions. If that's what the data shows, that's what it shows. Uh, but it'll be really interesting to see. Um, what about if you have a big garden and there's a couple of areas in it? Is it, do you, do you, do you encourage people to divide it up or pick a section? Um, we kind of pick something that you can monitor well on a regular basis every week. So if you have a garden that goes down for a mile, you know, you're not going to be walking down a mile every day to see the bird, or if you do, you're going to be spooking the birds. So something you can comfortably see from inside the house, I would say. And that can be a mix of front garden, back garden. Um, you know, certainly my parents' garden, Roscommon, is quite long, so there'll be all the birds at the feeders, which are near the house. But further down the garden, there's going to be bigger birds like blackbirds, sunfoot, rook, cat-dog. So I count all them. Whatever you can comfortably see uh, from your kitchen window or from your window or the house, whatever. Room you pick. Um, is, are goldfinches eating less niger seed or going off the niger seed? Is there any? I, I would say the same thing is probably happening as happened with the linnets. So I would say the lack of, I would say when green finch was were around in big numbers, uh, goldfinches couldn't get a look in on the the sunflower seeds, so they were sticking to the niger because nothing else was going for the niger. Now that there aren't as many green finches. It's an open door uh, on sunflower um, seed feeders uh, for goldfinches. So I think they're taking advantage of that. And I think they're not as bothered uh, with Niger as they used to be. Uh, what happens if you don't have a garden, but you have a window, or you live in an apartment? Yeah, uh, I, <laughs> I have a friend who's living in an apartment in, in Dublin city, and he gets about five different species to his balcony feeders, and he saw them all on the first day. So he's kind of thinking that, That'll be the excitement over now for the rest of the winter, but he's going to keep doing the survey. Um, again, something you can see maybe from your balcony, um, you know, maybe there's a green area down around the apartment complex or something like that where you can hang a few feeders and, you know, could walk down to the door downstairs and have a look out um, every now and again. Um, maybe your place of work, if you're not working from home, um, there might be an opportunity somewhere like that. Um, it doesn't have to strictly be a garden. It can be a, a green area, but the important thing is that if you say, if you do the survey in one area, next year, don't do it in the same area and expand it or shrink it. Do it in the exact same area. The, you know, don't be tempted to change the boundaries um, in future years. Whatever boundaries you use this year, stick to it next year and every year after that. Um, bird food from last season that was left over and it was, store it was stored. Um, I would say if it's peanuts, I would be looking through it. And if they're a bit shriveled or a bit moldy, get rid of them. I would say if they're seeds and they've been kept in an airtight container and they seem okay, they're probably all right. Um, if there's mold, throw it out. If they're peanuts and they're all shriveled up, throw them out. Um, otherwise, a lot of seeds would probably hold okay. Okay, yeah. Um, a couple of questions about identifying birds. Can you give a, can you recommend a book and yeah, um, I, if you put in, to, if you look at the Birdwatch Ireland shop, I can't remember which book we have in stock at the moment. There's a fantastic book by Jim Wilson and Mark Carmody um, that is based on Irish birds. It's a nice kind of pocket sized. It's really comprehensive, really easy to understand. Um, it's either, you know, it's Ireland's birds or Ireland's garden birds or something to that effect. There's also a similar book by Jim Wilson and Oren O'Sullivan um, that covers kind of something similar. They're both excellent books, about 15 euro, really, really good. If you're really getting into twitching and you're trying to learn more about loads of other birds, <coughs> Colin's bird guide is a great one, but it can be quite technical. So, you know, depend on your level. But a bird book is something that will cost you 15, 20 quid and you'll have it for a life. Great investment. I've got countless amounts of bird books. You can never have enough because they all describe the birds in a different way. They illustrate them in a slightly different way. And something in a different illustration might kind of help a click with you a bit better. So I recommend those two books. Jim Wilson and Mark Carmody, or Jim Wilson and Orrin O'Sullivan, um, Ireland's Garden Birds and Ireland's Birds. Um, but otherwise, um, check out the Birdwatch Ireland shop because we've got some good books there as well. Okay, here's a uh, Ricky Whelan special question. Um, crows, can crows communicate with each other and tell each other where the food is, this food in your garden? 
Are the no, crows? Crows, crows are awful stupid. Tell Ricky crows are stupid. They couldn't do that, not at all. Yeah, crows are, are ridiculously intelligent. So it, it's the same thing as starlings. When starlings do these big murmurations and go to their roosts in the winter months, and there's a huge amount of information exchange there. And crows do the exact same thing. And you can see some roosts of huge numbers of crows gathering in the evening. Um, and again, it, it's all about communication. It's about sharing heat, but it's also about sharing information of where the good feeding is. So if you put out food and you notice maybe one rook has found it today, you might notice that two or three arrive tomorrow and four or five the next day, you know, because they communicate about where the good feeding is. So they're very social birds and incredibly intelligent. Um, someone was just asking about the an alternative to the fry text when you're making your own fat oh, yeah. oils. And is coconut oil okay to you? No, because that doesn't, in, in temperatures in Ireland, we can have quite mild winters. Coconut oil doesn't set as hard as beef dripping or as lard. Um, for the same reason, you can use margarine. Um, it'll melt and you can put it together. It'll look like it's doing the right job, but the coconut oil does not get cold enough it stays a little bit greasy in the warmer temperatures. And again, that's going to cause problems. So no, probably not coconut oil to do it. Okay, but it's okay for the birds. It's just a mess. It's okay for them to eat, but it, it's, it's like grease and stuff like that that's the issue there, yeah. Okay, and just the final few are about populations of, could you mention the starting population if it's going up population across Europe, it's declining across Europe, and I think they might be amber listed in Ireland, but they're amber listed because they're declining across Europe. Ireland is one of very, very few countries, two or three countries in Europe, where our sterling population, our breeding population is actually doing okay, and they're perfectly stable. Um, so we're, you know, people get annoyed by them a little bit, and they can hang around people a lot and be a bit bothersome, but actually they're, you know, we're really lucky, and we shouldn't take it for granted that they're actually doing okay in Ireland. And um, I think someone asked about house sparrow as well. House fire are declining in a lot of places, but they're actually doing okay now. They're actually increasing um, in Ireland a little bit, um, but again, declining in a lot of parts of Europe and a lot of the bigger bigger cities and places like London as well. So again, a species we could easily take for granted, but uh, we're quite lucky that they're doing okay here. Yeah, and with the starlings, that's one of the reasons we're doing the survey. So that's we... it, yeah, because a load of them, they, if people look up that um, blog on the website, that news item, um, starlings come from all over Europe. To Ireland for the winter. So when you're looking at those murmurations, they could be from 20 or 30 different countries. So uh, we would like to gather more information on those murmurations so that we know where they are. We can maybe go about trying to find a way to protect them a bit better. And um, because in the winter months, we're looking after, you know, a lot of Europe's sterling, not just our own population. And the buzzards in popula the buzzard population increasing, great success story. But um, what is the reason for the continued increase in buzzards? Yeah, it's just that they're filling an ecological niche that was completely unoccupied. So we had no bird of prey doing what buzzards do in Ireland for a hundred years. Um, they're a really flexible diet. They will eat insects and worms. They will eat small birds. They will eat medium and big birds, uh, like pigeons and crows. And we have no shortage of them in Ireland. They'll eat mice, rats, rodents. They're not fussy birds. If you think of a, a peregrine falcon, that's a real specialist hunter. If you think of a golden eagle, a real specialist hunter. Buzzards are not specialist hunters. They will eat anything that's going. Uh, and if you can do that, you are one of the bird species that will thrive. Um, so there's still loads of space for them in Ireland. You know, them, they're still kind of filling, filling a few gaps um, that were left uh, unfilled for hundreds. Okay, brilliant. Um, do you want to take that very last question? Why do birds poop in bird baths? <laughs> water source. That's an excellent question. Um, I suppose they're used. Yeah, you know, they're just not thinking. Yeah, but it's a bit of a bit of a nuisance when you put out some fresh water and you see a bird and immediately then it's they've fouled it with their droppings. Yeah, uh, yeah that's why it's important to keep yeah, flushing it out and then and give those dishes a wash. But yeah, if only they could learn not to do that. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's the same with the feeders. Really, they'll be. If it's a large feeder, there'll be poop yeah. on that as well. It needs to be cleaned out. Yeah. And yeah, never put your water dish underneath the feeders because it'll just get a huge amount of poop in it very, very quickly. So yeah, avoid that one. Okay. Well, I think we've covered pretty much all, all the questions. So I just want to thank you again, Brian, for that excellent talk. Um, um, I'll, I'll just jump in and say, if anyone has any any questions, give us Bird Watch Ireland a shout out on Facebook if I didn't answer anything here. Um, Garden Birds at birdwatchireland.ie is my, my email address. 
Um, any questions I didn't answer here today, fire them to me in an email. I'd be more than happy to answer them. Garden birds at Birdwatch Ireland. Okay, very yeah. good. <laughs> You've opened you've opened the floodgates there now. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks a million for that talk. Absolutely brilliant. And we're we're up and running now. So if anyone hasn't started yet, we're in week one. That's it. And um, just thanks a million, everyone, for coming tonight, for all, all your volunteering help. The more the merrier. Yeah. yeah. And thanks to Community Foundation and Bally Blue. And our next talk is going to be on the 19th of January. And it's going to be Neve Fitzgerald doing some water birds. So wintertime is an excellent time for, for getting to know some of, the, of your water birds, the migrants. So good night, everyone. And thanks a million, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Good to talk to you. Thanks.